like an ab roller uh, or something along those lines. Um, there, I think we finally are live. I don't know why this is there. We, there we are. Yep. So then we would have, okay, you're doing um, rectus abdominis. You would have something like your rectus abdominis, which is right here. So if we're looking at how to actually build core strength for athletes, traditionally, you know, when we were on the come up or when I was on the come up back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, I would just be focused on, okay, we're going to do abs. So we're going to do a million crunches, right? And then things started to get a little bit more advanced. We would say, okay, well, if we're looking at our abs, we can't just sit here and say, all right, it's just the rectus abdominis. We would also want to think about like, okay, the, the obliques or even, uh, you know, how does, how does everything, even to a point, how do the lats play into our, our core, right? How do our lats play into our core? How does the transverse abdominus play into our core? How does all this sort of work together? Okay. With the obliques, with the rectus abdominis, with our lats, with our rectus spinae, with everything to just hold everything stable right and i even think about the easiest way to almost envision uh the core right and 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 the the importance that the core plays would be and i like to refer to it more so as the trunk is that if you see a skier okay so you see a skier going downhill and if you can visualize as somebody you know you're you're visualizing that this skier on their feet instead of skis that's the wheels okay and the trunk is this the steering mechanism the trunk is actually the steering wheel okay so if you see a skier that is a top-notch skier they are super stable in their trunk there's almost no noise like they're not they're not flopping all over the place they're just boom 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 boom, right? They're just going back and forth. So to me, is that the core, the core is involved for sure, but let's just refer to this as the trunk. And so some of those common misconceptions is that when, and I believe, how do I get a six pack for my pool party tomorrow from Russell, Russell Bowman, you got to, it's going to take you longer than your pool than tomorrow, Russell, you got to start front squatting more, more zombie squats. When we, when we think of it as just our core, well, then we're looking at just specifically like isolation movements, which are great. They're fantastic, which you could do like a V up or you could do a crunch or you could do an ab roller or, you know, anything's pretty simple, a pretty standard uh, core exercise. But then if we take that next step, you say, okay, instead of viewing this as our core, what if we start to view it as the trunk and then we start to get a little bit more dialed in with bigger movements that are more global because then we can start to understand all right well now i like to look at it like the trunk is literally just another body part okay so if we look at the quads and we train the quads with front squats and then if we have somebody who gets injured with their quad well then we know that we can dial in their quad a little bit more by possibly doing leg extensions or spanish squats something along those lines and that's the same way we should be viewing the core so if we want to view the core in the the realm of performance we identify okay rectus abdominis obliques transverse abdominis yes there's a bunch there's a few others involved but that's the the three key players and then how are we going to um train them globally with a front squat, with a zombie squat, with plyometrics, with pause plyometrics, with uh, off-weighted exercises, with dynamic movements like a power snatch. And a lot of people often forget they're these core gurus, but yet you throw a, a power snatch overhead and these people can't even control themselves in an overhead position because they don't have that core stability. They don't have that trunk control. They don't have that trunk stability. And so if we look at... Uh, I like using that image of the of the skier because then you can start to see that if your core is weak and you're out of position, there's an immediate error from a skier that you will see they'll come off track. They won't be able to cut around the the targets as effectively. They won't be able to hold as much speed. But the ironic part of the unique thing is that if you can see that visual with the skier, that's happening also with sprinters. That's happening with running backs. That's happening with ice hockey that's ice hockey big time that's happening with wrestling so if you have somebody who is in a position now i like to talk and i use this example is that when we worked with nick wisdowski okay so he's a two-time world bronze medalist and when we trained nick and he would come on site and we would work with him 
some of the biggest things that I always notice is like Nick was strong, cleaned 160, uh, you know, could bench press probably close to 405, uh, back squatted pl- over 500, was, was strong, not ungodly strong, but strong, right? Very stout. Was he, what was his strength levels like relative to a shot putter or a discus thrower? Not that good. But the crazy part with Gwiz is that when you would when you would like push or pull and and line up and, and just you know Gwiz would show you a wrestling move or anything along those lines, you would just feel like he was an absolute monster. And what I noticed was his trunk was not moving. He was able to apply all this force because his trunk was stable and then all of the energy from his hands and from his you know feet was transferred through his core and that's how his mechanism of control was absolutely f- fantastic and so why we should be training our athletes to have a strong core you know early on when we have athletes that do have weak abs right or a weak core you can use isolation movements like a crunch as a contrast method with front squats or with, you know, zombie squats or even back squats or single leg squats. And now you pair that front squat or zombie squat with something like a ab roller or a crunch. And now all of a sudden their core strength just skyrockets because now they know how to use their core when they're doing that global movement. And so those are the key concepts and the key aspects around uh, core based training is that the whole point, the whole goal is that we're trying to look at this and say, okay, if we can strengthen the rectus abdominis and if we can strengthen the obliques and if we can strengthen just the way the core functions and if we can look at it from that global goal, we want to run faster. We want to cut quicker. We want to jump more uh, explosively. We're a wrestler and we want more uh more ability to change levels and apply a massive amount of force in a very condensed area. If we can comprehend that, and I'm even thinking about like a shot putter, when the shot putter gets to the front of the circle, if they have a weak core, they'll fall backwards instead of being able to apply that force forward. But ultimately it comes back to understanding that high speed movements like a snatch or a hang snatch or a power clean or a hang clean or a behind the neck jerk. If you can train those globally at high speeds and then train them with absolute strength movements like a back squat, a heavy back squat or a heavy front squat. And then you can also train them, uh, in an isolation perspective, now you're training them at various different degrees. You're fatiguing them from an isolation perspective. You're fatiguing them from a global perspective. You're fatiguing them from high speed. You're fatiguing them from plyometrics. So core-based training has to transfer to the specific sport. And if we have somebody who is a running back and they have trunk problems, they, they're not as, uh, they're at, maybe their, their shuttle run, let's say their shuttle run as a test isn't that good, but their 40 is good but they can't cut. Well, typically what you'll see is their glutes are weak and their abs are weak. Okay. And why are they weak? Maybe they're not weak in the sense that they can do a hundred crunches, but they're weak in the sense that when they go to cut, they collapse to that one side and they don't get cut. They don't get out of that cut as, as well as possible. And so, you know, that's some of the big factors. So now we're going to look at some of these crazy core exercises, uh, that we're going to, we're going to analyze and break down. And then you guys can ask some questions and we're going to we're going to come back into uh, this discussion. So the first thing I want to do is show you guys uh, the Bioneer. I hope you. I wonder if you guys have ever uh, seen any of his stuff, but he's absolutely fantastic. We're going to analyze the Bioneer and some of the best ab exercises here. So give me about... La this Land is... Push-up. Named after an absolute there we go. The La Land push-up also, with the ab wheel, standing ab wheel is tough. To the ab rollout. The difference is that you're using your hands without the roller and simply performing a push-up... And this is also like... Position. Severe awesome shoulder and mobility and strength, but that's that's trunk control right there. Is amazing for stimulating a hypertrophic response and developing that six-pack look. Lizard crawls. The lizard crawl is a movement I have come to in the rain in, in the hail. Possibly that looks like hail. Crawling around car parks. The great thing about the lizard crawl is that it involves a continuous tension. And I actually think this is quite possibly one of the best warm-ups that you can do, especially with wrestlers and football players. Just get them to warm up. 
force to combat those wake up their arms resistance. wake up their trunks all kinds of additional benefits too like improved hip mobility yep and because you can do it for distance or for time let's see two more here and we gotta just keep thinking about what are we looking at we're trying to develop Hand athletes stands. we're trying to develop Hand that stands, powerful core but i also think this should be coming back to dynamic trunk control Okay. Now, I don't. This is one thing where I think skill, the skill work around like a walking handstand can be very, very challenging unless you've been exposed to gymnastics. If you've been exposed to gymnastics, um, it's a little bit easier uh, to, to do something along those lines. Whereas if you've never been exposed to gymnastics, you're a bigger dude like myself, weighing over 220, it can be harder. Now, using movements like this, great for developing that shoulder stability along with that trunk control. I've talked about these a lot. <coughs> carries Farmer so carries absolutely fantastic. Go heavy yeah, load. So valuable because we're keeping the core brace for long yep. periods to build Actually, you'll feel that quite a bit in the, exactly in the abs when you have that out right. in front of you. You can use loaded carries with a heavy trap bar yep. by holding something over your shoulders or by holding Okay, so we're now that's some of some real good more advanced the advanced stuff. Now let's look at some OTA stuff here. Core with my elite level athletes. Let's get into it. Here we go. Yo, what's going on guys? Chris Barner with Overtime Athletes. So for today's video, I think um, there's a lot of different ways that you can skin a cat when it comes to that. I just want to kind of offer how I look at There we go. I love that side med ball slams. That's another one where you can see if, okay, so the individual who's just doing the seated sit up into a throw. Was, was that person, okay, sit up and throw. If they have trunk control, they can control that and apply a large amount of force, right? If they don't have trunk control, they would receive that ball and fall backwards. I like to use this test at the Z press test. So the Z press test is you sit down on your butt, legs straight out, and you get a barbell and you start to press. Okay, if that barbell, let's say it's got 40 kilos on it, you go to press it, you lower it, and when you lower it, you fall backwards. Well, that's, you don't have trunk control. Whereas if you can hold stable, and press in the Z press position, you've got trunk control. And then we can keep building upon that. Now that's an absolute strength movement, but then we can start to build with a little bit more dynamic movement. So what I believe Barnard does here is that he goes through stability issues here. This is fantastic way to warm up. Uh, he goes through all of these uh, terms that you can learn and, and apply into training, but you would go, I think it's, if I remember correctly, shit, I'd it goes into the most dynamic version at the end. And I think that's important to learn. Um, I'm going to skip a little. Yep, there we go. So there you go. Slightly more dynamic, but there's still going to be more control. And then finally, there we see some real, much more integrative uh, methods that you can use to train that that core to train that that core strength and then finally we've always got to get explosive okay, so core strength training for athletes with that i think that's a, oh man we get an ad there we go. so i stole this when i was you know this 2008 2009 working with some of the some of the coaches some of the athletes at the poliquin group in rhode island this is going way back now this is a movement that one of the ice hockey coaches had showed us. So it's hold this bar over your face, okay? And you're in, you're going to try to get... You guys should try some of these while you're watching. You should lay down and just try this right now. Boom. With a slower eccentric. Boom. Oh, yep. And this is where it's like explosive <laughs> core work. Explosive core work is really trunk control. And now we're learning how to isolate at high speeds, right? Boom. Boom. Oh, yeah. And so that's going to be a great movement for speed-based transfer. Okay, so let's get to this next one. One of my next ones is going to be high speed. I love side med ball throws because they, well, the, the abs are slower twitch. Just might even say, hey, what about in college when you would vomit everywhere because you drank it? You'd be sore the next day. That's a, a fight in favor of explosive work for side med balls or for abs. That is actually an example I have used in the past about the puking. You'll be sore in your abs the next day. Crossover. Boom. So we do a crossover so with the side med balls. We do a side jump into a side here. med ball throw. Um, anything to make and this a little bit now. more dynamic. It's going to be dependent upon that, that specific sport too. So let's get that through. Not like that. This one's tough. And I'm gonna go. Boom. This one's very tough, oh. but very good. And, I, and this is a movement. You know, we sort of played around with something similar to this when uh, we went down to see knees over toes guy. Um, Ooh, so that really 
was quite similar to this, but on a on a lying position. And I think that these are really good exercises. I think there's one more here. Here's my favorite right here. And this is something that I think that anybody like a skier, um, running backs, baseball players especially, like using this movement here, so we call this Dane's Fast Abs. If you are in a sport that's rapid rotation you've got to learn how to decelerate and then reuse that transfer okay so this is like the impulse version of trunk so training okay so if you can master this it's going to go a long freaking way so those are some good examples that i wanted to share with you guys and then finally one of the other aspects that i thought was phenomenal um is like i wanted to share this paper here where we're just going to go over some of the effects of core training on skill performance and this means like and then some of the comments here that I can see coming in are around uh, how do we improve our skill performance for potentially arm wrestling? How do we improve? How do we become more skillful, skillful for baseball? Uh, even to the point of, let's say, how, let's say we're a wide receiver. How can I run a better route as a wide receiver? Uh, what can I do to improve that? And in this paper uh, from 2022, the effect of core training on skill performance among athletes, they took 16 different papers okay 16 papers these meta they, they combine them then into this meta analysis and they started to look at okay if we're breaking down 16 of the 119 and they have an inclusion process where only 16 out of the 119 uh, meet the data that they're looking for they're trying to figure out what's the effect of core training on athlete skill performance so can you play badminton better the skill aspect better if you are dialed in with a stronger core or with a stronger uh, trunk, right? And so I mean, they're using core here, but initially core training could potentially improve skill performance among football, handball, basketball, swimming, dancing, karate, Muay Thai, gymnastics, volleyball, badminton, and golf. So when you're looking at these, you know, traditional training methods in my mind would be bench squat, clean, you know, bench squat, deadlift, something like that, right? And I think that the downfall is that we lump ourselves as coaches into Weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding, core training, functional. Like you look at all those things and you go, okay, what if we wanted to train people how to move heavyweight fast? We want them to be strong. And then outside of being stronger, we want them to execute plyometrics and we want to improve their ability to recruit throughout their trunk. That's where we're going to be focused on right here is now we're looking at this going, okay, so if we're focused on core training, we might have a combat athlete, a fighter, that if we can train from a global movement, so let's say they do zombie squats, and then they train with side med ball throws like we demonstrated in the video, and we do that more effectively, because of that, there's going to be more stability and more silence in their trunk, which in turn should, in theory, lead to greater skill performance or skill learning. So it's one of the ways to develop a more skillful athlete is to actually focus on that trunk control, okay? Is to get the athlete to be a little bit more coordinated. And it's just a really, really unique thing to think about because if you can't control your trunk, and I'm just thinking about a thrower or a baseball pitcher, right? If you don't have that trunk stability, you're not going to learn the mechanics of the shoulder. You're not going to learn the mechanics of the arm slot. You're not going to learn the mechanics of what your feet are doing because you can't control yourself to be in those positions because your core is not strong enough because your trunk isn't in under control. And it's the same thing if you're a javelin thrower and you're running full speed or if you're a sprinter and you're flailing all over the place or, or a running back, you're not going to be as skillful because you can't hold those specific positions. So we've got to understand you know, where this really comes into play uh, and how we can use them. And I would use them with contrast methods. I would use them in isolation movements. And if I had uh, somebody who struggled quite a bit with their, their core strength, I would use them at the end of an upper body day. I would use them at the end of a leg day. I would use them on an impulse day and just really try to develop them wholeheartedly over a long period of time. I think that's the other factor is that it's not something, because it's a slower twitch muscle group, it can take a bit more volume. It, you know, it can handle, they, the, the, the trunk can handle a bit more volume. Uh, now, you have to be careful when you start doing high speed work, but you've just got to be aware of that. And so before we continue with the Q&A, I'm going to come back into the Q&A. If you guys are interested in a deeper dive discussion on all aspects of training and coaching specific to your goals, 
please consider becoming a channel member. Uh, we meet every single Friday where I give you direct tips on improving your training. It's a positive group. A lot of people that are motivated, super motivated coaches and athletes. It costs 10 dollars a month just 10 bucks a month so that's a one hour lecture every single week that's cheaper than a cup of coffee 10 bucks a month but if you don't want to spend that 10 bucks make sure you check out all of our garage strength podcasts uh, on all the channels you can go to youtube you can go on to spotify apple podcasts check out the garage strength podcast um, all you have to do is just click the link in the description so we're getting some good questions i think one of my favorite questions actually just got posed what sport do you think takes the most amount the most amount of I'm trying to get my mouse over there the most amount of core strength and I think that that question is so interesting because it's there's so many different sports so we are back over here I'm just going to come back over I'm in full control today of the <clears throat> feeling a little bit under the weather how are you guys feeling I think when I'm looking at it, Keese is back in. Okay, so it's funny, arm wrestling content for sure. Lizard crawls, sled pull. Lizard crawls, sled pull, yay or nay. I think that might be a little bit of overkill. I think that Karipa, I think that might be a little bit aggressive. Um, I don't think it's bad. Um, oh, my mouse. There's like this. <coughs> okay, so if we get into this, somebody just said, That's a good, that'd be cool if we did, if we did a podcast with the Bioneer. Keith, do you think you watch more YouTube than me or do you think I watch more YouTube than you? Um, <clears throat> power keg or six pack? I would say that would be dependent upon the sport. Power keg, if I'm a super heavyweight weightlifter, power lifter, left tackle, D, or D tackle, offensive lineman, defensive lineman, except for the ends. If I'm an edge rusher, I don't want a power keg. Um, shot putters, maybe discus throwers. I would go power keg. If I'm looking for a six pack, I'm going sprinter, probably even 800 meters to 1500 meters, uh, crossfitters. Uh, I would look at wrestlers as well as, as going for that the actual shredded six six pack abs um i think when some of the other factors here is like when we're doing okay our, our heavy compound movements plyos and one-sided movements like single arm bench presses or single leg squats enough to train core i think they're enough to train core i still like two to three isolation core exercises a week where you just target the abs uh in an isolated perspective like ab roller or something and you just do two or three sets just to feel it just for it to be there and i wanted to share this I'll, I'll share this this visual i was playing around with some movements this week and i know i'm a little bit out of, out of scene here but i had a band behind me here <clears throat> so the band's up here and i'm rowing here so i'm going like this boom and then i go real control boom right so I was doing that movement with Brandon George, who's a starting linebacker at Pitt, and we're playing around with it. And he's like, dude, this is really good. It's like throwing a stiff arm and pushing, and pulling an offensive lineman. And so the the unique part, and the poll results are in. I forgot here. If you guys check out those poll re results, what is better? DTC or active core stabilization. What's better? Dynamic trunk control or core stabilization? Active core stabilization. In my mind, Dynamic trunk control in your guys' mind, 75% of you voted dynamic trunk control. That's freaking sweet. So <clears throat> when you start to look at exercises that involve the trunk, and I've even been thinking, okay, if we called ab exercises, so isolation exercises maybe could be ab. If we call core exercises like like I'm thinking about like a, a dead hang pull up with a plate on your feet, that would be a core exercise maybe dynamic trunk control exercises could be a zombie squat could be uh, uh off-weighted kettlebell walks or jumps with a kettlebell something like that i'm trying to differentiate ab to core to trunk because i think there will need to be some type of focus on that um but i think ultimately a lot of this is going to come back to uh how do you handle the 
entire trunk position when you do a front squat. You know, a lot of people dump forward. Well, you don't have trunk control because your back's a little bit weak. You can't stay upright. And it mainly is your lower back in that sense. Um, you're also not filling up your belly button with air. You know, you want to fill in here. Think about weightlifters when they dip at the bottom of a dip. They should fill that that belt with air. Same with the best power lifters in the world. That's what they're doing. It's the exact same concept um, to, to, to make that stable trunk so that you're dipping here and you're able to control that. And I think you'll even see that with shot putters and discus throwers is that they're rotating. They're not breathing. <sighs> Typically, what they end up doing is they'll bring in air and then they go and then they let out a yell. Okay, right? So they're actually controlling the air until that final position when they release <clears throat> so that's some of the big things that we can do. So I think if you look at, uh, you know, actually here's a good question from fried rice boy, not related to core strength, but is pin bench or pause bench helpful to shot put or discus? Yes, for sure. So lizard, lizard curls. We answered that. What sport do you think takes the most core? <coughs> I honestly would probably say wrestling. Um, yeah, I would, I would err on the side of wrestling as far as needing the most core. But even if you watch, so a unique one here is going to be swimming. And a lot of people just, you know, they, they don't realize that you can, you get in the pool, they, they think you just swim, right? But if you look at when you get into the pool, if you can hold your hip height and hold your posture in a good enough position in the water, it makes it easier for you to swim faster, okay? And this relates back to the research paper that we covered. If you have that core stabilization, if you have that trunk control, you can learn the skill or the technique of swimming at higher speeds, and now you're going to be a better swimmer. So oftentimes when we're laying it out, you know, some of the state champs that we've developed in swimming, when we lay out their system, okay, and the NCAA All-Americans that we have, you look at it and you go, okay, if they can have better posture, let's just use a great, great exercise for a swimmer, a walrus. Okay, you do a walrus. You, you're in a push-up position. You walk with your hands forward like this. You put a plate on your back and you got to hold like a hollow position, similar to the push-up that we saw from the, the Bioneer. Now that becomes even more dynamic and it's going to transfer to the pool really, really well based off of the posture that they're holding. So we've got to look through the lens of the sport when we're thinking through this. It's like discus throwers or, or the movement that we use for, for the linebacker push-pull. Uh, or even any anything along those lines is like if we're if we're training a discus thrower or let's say a wrestler and they execute a side medicine ball throw at very high speeds, they're going to have trunk control and they're also going to have the high speed energy transfer. So it's going to pay huge dividends for them long term. Keith just said, I watch more. I got I watch got more YouTube playing than you. The mostly kid stuff that this live is close to the most I watch a day. Okay. I watch quite a bit of kids stuff too. Um, I, I don't, so <clears throat> DAW athletics, is that you diamond Wolford? When, when is, when it comes to dynamic ability through the core, things like med ball throws, physio ball work, help build that ability to stretch ballistically and rotate out of positions. How often do you use things like the physio ball work? I would say once to twice a week. Um, and typically what I'm going to do, depending on the skill position of the athlete, um, it could be up to three times a week. I don't want to fatigue their trunk so much that they can't execute their technical sport. Um, but for somebody, you know, especially if I'm in preparation with football, I would say two to three times a week. As we get closer, maybe that's only once a week. During in season, maybe two sets a week. Uh, but it would really come down to looking at it and saying, how can we, you know, take something like physio ball work, um, you know, in a push-up position and you're you're just doing a pike or something like that. Like that stuff does go quite a long way as far as trunk control. And I think that what's interesting to me where I've sort of gotten turned off from a lot of the core movements is that if I looked at a back squat, a single leg front, a front squat, single, a front, uh, front loaded single leg squat, right? So like the Miles Garrett video that we just posted on Peak Strength Channel, if you guys want to see a crazy core exercise, go do a front single leg squat. Okay. Miles Garrett's in there just repping like 275. Um, if you look at those exercises, pull-ups with a plate in your feet, um, zombie squats, I think I mentioned zombie single leg squats, uh, you know, any th walking lunges with a plate overhead, that's going to train your trunk pretty freaking well. Then you bring in stuff like the Dane's fast abs that we demonstrated or physio ball work. Those things improve, uh, 
quite a bit. They're going to help improve that core strength and that trunk control. And I think where we forget and where I was going with this whole thought is like, I've sort of gotten so, I I feel like on, on social media, it's easy to dominate the world of core training because it looks so cool. And there's some freaking awesome exercise. Protein Poppy is one guy that has the best, the best core exercises. And he posts them like almost regularly. His core exercises are freaking phenomenal. But the big factor then is like, okay, how do you take those exercises, piece them into that lower body impulse day, piece them into the lower body strength day, piece them into the upper body day, piece them into an athlete day. And then we've got to think, okay, if we have two to three uh, of those cool movements each program, and then you develop them over a long period of time. What are the progressions to get to that point? That's the one thing I liked about the OTA videos. Chris Barnard does a great job breaking down the progressions to get to that point. Then you have to learn as an athlete, based off your testing, who can progress faster through these progressions versus who needs to go a little bit slower, right? And some people need to go slower. I've I've talked about this in the past. Um, Two of our athletes, actually, uh, we talked about moving slow to go fast. Jake Horst was so twitchy, dude had a 44-inch vertical, and sometimes he was so twitchy he was out of position. He just couldn't control it. Aiden Martin, he plays at – he's a safety at Monmouth right now for football. Another guy, super, super twitchy, like 40-plus-inch vertical. Could He bench-pressed like 375, weighing 170, just like a powerhouse. But sometimes was out of position on a power clean, and he'd like fall over because he was so explosive. So if we can train the trunk – very well and this is where doing like the 5s protocol and plyometrics comes into play if you can force your athletes to stop or give a little stutter step now that's another way to train the trunk to then control the noise of when they're at high speeds uh so we've got to look at what we're trying to transfer with with everything right so i'm a football player my yard is a slight hill is it all right to do plyos yes for sure uh, this is for CD, a great, I would do single leg bounds. I would do backward hill sprints. I would do bounds up the hill. Uh, I would do squat and jumps into a sprint. I would do jump lunges backwards. You could do everything on that hill. Would you consider a snatch to be a core exercise when it comes to stabilizing it? So this is a great question from Fried Rice Boy. And this is the thing I want to throw out there. Okay, so I remember hearing Al Vermeil. He trained the, the Chicago Bulls when they won those six world titles. He also coached the Bears as a strength coach when they won their world title back in the late 80s. I believe he's the only strength coach to have done that, hired by the teams. So Alver, Alver Meal would talk about how like Horace Grant uh, would, would do like a two-box power snatch at like 100 kilos or 90 kilos, and they'd hold it overhead like one, two, and then they'd drop it. And they talked about you have a big center like Horace Grant or Scotty Pippen cleaning something, but they would hold those overhead positions because that's the position he would be in when he was on the defense. And so if you can be in that position and be stable, your defense is going to be that much better. And that goes back to that paper that we provided you guys. So now if I'm looking at the snatch, and this is where a lot of these people who are like the the functional gurus or all about like core direct core training, but they don't want to lift heavy weights. It's like, okay, so how about this? How about you put 275 pounds overhead and hold it there? How about you get, you know, we've got kids in high school, Brandon George, who, you know, could behind the neck jerk 150 kilos and smoke it and hold it and be stable in that position. That's a strong core. That's a very, very strong core. Actually, so we have a on site this week, we've got a seven time NCAA champ, Cheyenne Williamson. Okay. We can look her up seven times NCAA champ. I think last year she got like sixth or seventh at a us outdoors in the HEP. One of the best female collegiate athletes in the history of the NCAA. Okay. Legitimately like this is like, 100%. 100%. And one thing when we were working today on her, her her throws technique, she's a heptathlete. She's super explosive. Okay. She's very explosive. She's also strong. Yesterday she was back squatting. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you could see her back squatting on my story yesterday. But rotationally, she is a little weak with her trunk. Okay. When she rotates, she's not able to hold those positions as well. And it's something that I think potentially could be an issue in her high jump as well as in her throws javelin and and in the shot and so one thing that she needs to focus on maybe a little bit more is just dialing it dialing in that rotational strength so then it transfers even better to her sport so she can start to chip away at trying to make the olympics and becoming you know one of the best heptathletes in the in the u.s so i hope that 
that makes sense a little bit. Jeffrey Port, hey, how are you? Do you ever make a video regarding strength training for karate? I think we have, and I have, Jeffrey, I have gotten uh, contacted about karate training. Um, I also look at karate training you know, similar to Taekwondo uh, and inside of peak strength. Uh, I think there's judo. So if you click on inside peak strength, uh, combat sports, I want to say Taekwondo is in there, and I would lump karate in there no i'm not trying to offend you or anything but i think they are very similar strength qualities very you have to be very mobile you've got to be very fast you've got to be explosive uh, you've got to you got to be strong unilaterally and you have to have a very strong uh trunk is there a technical drill or cue to help avoid bar crash on the clean so this would be fried rice bo f fried rice boy this would be something that you're going to see in the future on garage strength weightlifting on that channel now when i'm going to try and fix somebody uh, who has the bar that crashes on them? And Keith, I'm going to answer one of your questions here shortly. The the next thing that I try to focus on is something like a no feet clean or a no feet power clean. A no feet power clean can help that. Uh, no feet cleans can help that quite a bit as well. Keith asks, how much should you lift before you are allowed to wear the Lou weightlifting shoes? You should be able to snatch body weight. Harry Potter Hustler, hi. How's the day going? Wanted to ask if there is any specific foam rolling that technique that is good for recovery. Uh, not that I know of off the top of my head. Would you consider, yeah, in the summit phase, we're supposed to hit PRs, but does that mean every single week you're taking a PR attempt or do you progressively overload? In the summit phase, you will take a lot of heavy lifts. You will. And especially early on, you're going to be really fatigued. Week three, week four, you're going to smash PRs, like smash them huge PRs because you're going to get so adapted at taking that heavy load and, and just it's going to be something that you're very comfortable uh, comfortable with Ted William Granado Santana you are the best thank you so Ted Williams is one of the best Hani Mansori what's the best way to train the hips for a basketball player and for how many days uh two to three days a week I would say uh power snatch I would say single leg squats I would say uh, front single legs. I would say box squats, anything along those lines. Have you ever heard of Bubka's? They are, yes, uh, close to toes the bar for sure. Um, and Sergey Bubka is a former uh, world record holder in the in the pole vault, but I know that movement is great for the lats. It's great for the core. It's almost like a inverted. It's not necessarily a skin the cap, but it's similar to skin the cap, but a great, great one. Uh Dude, Keist, I wanted to ask you this. I wanted to go back to Keist's one question on, will you make a video on how players in Bayern uh, München add 10 to 20K to their frame after they join the club? Can you send me any footage on this or, or DM it to me or post it in here and then we'll, we'll analyze that. And I would love to do a, a video on that because I just did. And I want to share this guys with, uh, with you guys, see what you think. I just did a podcast with Earl where I was like, tell me this. Let's look at the world of sports, right? The the sport that probably has the most money into research, um, soccer's up there or football's up there. American football has quite a bit of money into it. Like based off the fact that it's not a global sport like football is, it's it's very unique in that it's essentially done in like one main country. Yes, other countries do it, but they don't have as much invested into it. In the United States, sports performance like college teams will have entire entire uh university sports scientists devoted to make their football team better and so my argument was if you would look at someone like let's just take a throwback safety sean taylor ed reed these are some of the best safeties of all time right brian dawkins are you telling me i, I want to i just want to hear people's thoughts here that if we took Sean Taylor or Ed Reed, that they wouldn't be good soccer players. Like let's pretend that they came up in the system and they, 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 they came up in a soccer system in a European football system, right? A football system. They learn the skills, but they're physically trained the way Sean Taylor was trained, the way Ed Reed was trained, the, the way, um, I'm trying to think of somebody off the top of my head right now. Can I not, why can I not think of like a savage, uh, Gosh, I can't think of like a total animal safety currently, which there's plenty in the league. But let's just let's just play that that game. I mean, even someone like Richard Sherman back in the day, right? Are you telling me they wouldn't be really good soccer players? Like they have very, very high speed. They're large. They're extraordinarily explosive. They have good endurance. 
they're doing a lot of interval work. Like, I guess my question, and this goes back to what Keist is saying, is <laughs> Reggie Bush is the best soccer player. I mean, honestly, think about Reggie Bush in college. Probably the greatest collegiate football player of all time. And you're going to tell me that that dude, if, was, if he was physically trained the way that he was, he wouldn't have been able to apply that to the sport of football, you know, the European version of football. And I guess that's my question for soccer fans is like, Bayern, so, so, so if we look there at, at, at the Munich club, if they're adding 10 to 15 K or 10 to 20 K onto their athletes, like that makes sense if they're increasing muscle mass and they're maintaining their endurance, if they have more power output and more speed, like they're going to be in better positions because it, it exposes your, your opponents. If you've got a team filled with guys running four five forties, it's going to pay off. And I even like to think about like sprinters, like some of the sprinters out there that are some of the best sprinters, like Noah Lyles can power clean 300 pounds. Why aren't we doing that in these other sports? You know, and we, we sort of got off on this tangent based off of the NHL and how some of the guys in the NHL aren't as athletic or aren't as explosive. Um, I think you can use Turkish get-ups for athletes. I think, uh, I think they just take so long to get done. You do a Turkish getup. It's like, it's like an overrated, underrated thing. Like, are Turkish getups effective, dude? They're great exercises. What's my problem with them? They take too long, dude. They take so long to get them done. It's like, what if I just had you do five sets of five zombie squats and then you did like Chinese side bends or, or like a Copenhagen plank as a superset? Like, come on, zombie squats and freaking Copenhagen planks versus Turkish getups? Get out of here. Uh, Odell Beckham is great at soccer. Actually, that's a good example. A good, a good, yeah. So, you've seen a lot of crossfitters with protruding abs. I is size of abs a display of ab strength? I think it just depends. I I can't answer the protruding ab stuff. I know that there's that's like Palumboism, I believe is what it's called. Palumboism, if I remember, but I don't know enough about that. Um, hi Dana, use iron boots for core work as I am a dinosaur with a good core, stay safe and healthy. And I think that's a, that's a good old school iron boots are great. And what's interesting, uh, strength training for par parkour would be so fun to do. Zach, I would love to do that. I want to say this quick. Uh, one of my buddies was here today. We had training. There's a Notre Dame, uh, a guy going to Notre Dame to play guard, uh, Peter Jones, you guys can check him out. He's a total freak. I'm going to post some of the videos on my Instagram story today of his training session. But like Peter's just this big, huge 300 pound dude. Who's just wired, just totally wired and super, super strong. But uh, his high school coach, Eric, who I'm friends with, he was doing suitcase carries with 120 kilos. And I think that's like a way to train the core. And it's like, I can do a suitcase carry or a suitcase deadlift and probably get the same stimulation or better than like a Turkish getup. Now, I'm not saying Turkish getups are bad. I'm saying in the realm of time, I would prefer to do other movements. If I had more time to screw around and just tinker around, I would probably go with them and test them out for fun and maybe do like eight weeks of it. Um, I never understood when people do the Turkish getup, why do you put your hand down? I feel like you're, you shouldn't put your hand down because if you don't put your hand down, that's going to train more of your upper back mobility and your abs. So strength training for parkour, the way I would look at this would be, you've got to be super, super twitchy. I would, if, if I was looking at, okay, so here's my question is like, there's tricking and tricking is like, to me in place, somebody who's doing like essentially like gymnastics style stuff, like out in the grass, backflips, twists and stuff like that. Then there's parkour or free running parkour would be like, you're, you're, climbing across buildings and jumping into you know, like you would jump off the building and roll and stuff like that. What I would do for this is one dial in your new, your nutrition. Okay. You can't be heavy. You can't do parkour and weigh two thirty. I mean, you can, but you might not be the best at it. You've got to look at, uh, <coughs> high load training. So if I was training somebody for parkour, I'd want them to be very, very, very explosive. We're going to do a lot of plyometrics and we're going to do a lot of unilateral work. And we're going to do a lot of slow eccentrics because they're going to take on a crazy eccentric load. We're going to do a lot of stops. Okay. So we would do, uh, let's say like 
eccentric work with hooks and then the hooks come off. We're going to do some crazy, crazy eccentric single leg and then figure out how to do them unbroken. And we want to put them into these positions through the slow eccentric, through the rapid eccentrics even. And we would do, uh, you know, rapid eccentrics with a pause, uh, things like that to try and train them to really light things up as quickly as possible. These guys and women have phenomenal, phenomenal force absorption and power output just off the charts. And so I think that learning from them and then also building a system around them, that would be unbelievably enjoyable. Um, Rambler, what's the strength or rep standard to strive for? For Copenhagen and zombie squats, I can only do three reps per side at the Copenhagen at the school gym. What if you did like 60 seconds each side and then on the zombie squats you did a set of four at like 100 kilos? That would be great. Can you work to, can you work out six times a week and still perform on Sunday in the game for a soccer player? I think you could perform. I think you could work out three to four days a week and do that. Uh, three to four days a week, I think you can do it. How do you train for bending around the edge as a stand up pass rusher? Uh, bending around the edge, we're going to look at ankle mobility, uh, hip mobility. Uh, I would like to to focus on something like a very low angle sled push, very low angle sled pull, uh, lots of single leg work, some banded work. Um, would X NFL yeah, so I, I think I think I would do quite a bit of that that training uh for the bend, but it's gonna be around the hip. It's gonna be around the hip and the and the thing is too is that you've gotta think like that that quote from like D Lyman is like one arm is longer than two. And essentially meaning like you can twist here and get skinny and post up on somebody, but you've got to have really low hip uh hip drop which means you're going to have a really steep shin angle, which also means you're going to be able to accelerate very quickly, but you have to be able to control that. So there's a couple of different factors there. Ooh, do I think that soccer is more skill-based than the NFL, which is why the physical development starts later? Dude, that's a good question, Keist, and I don't really know the answer to that. Is, is soccer more skillful than football? I think it's probably – it's such a hard one to – to break down, I would say that soccer is probably more skillful to a point because it happens at a higher speed. The skill points happen at a higher speed because the opposition is not as heavy. The heavier the load of your opposition, technically this the skill execution is slower. But the only argument here would be if you look at wrestling and pummeling, and then you're looking at like uh, at football and stuff. And if you think about the first contact when, and I, you know, I'm thinking I've I've watched a lot of linemen discuss like when they watch somebody come out of their stance. The skill decisions happen so quickly, and it's so feeling based. It's it'd be like saying like, okay, I, I think it's a hard comparison because it's like comparing it to ultimate. Ultimate Frisbee is extraordinarily skillful. Um, I, I don't think it's a fair comparison to say soccer or ultimate is more skillful than football or that football is more skillful than soccer or or badminton or table tennis, right? Like, I, I think those sports are so fast. You know, based off physical development, I don't know. I think, I think traditionally, I think my argument would be Americans have just such like a, a physical culture. And dude, Iceland has a physical culture of, of resistance-based training. There's some really good freaking soccer players from Iceland, and it's a small country. So I guess that would be sort of my argument to a point. Um, Quinn, I would say don't throw on the sleeves and the belt until you're around 85 to 90%. Fried Rice Boy, what are the athletic and lifting numbers you would want for a beast edge rusher coming into college that could be achieved by a six foot, 240-pound person? Well, first, if you're an edge rusher, I don't know, I might move you interior at six foot. But I would say, you know, power, like, a, a, let's just say you clean 150 kilos or 140 kilos. Um, I would say that you single leg squat 134, 130 kilos for a set of five on each leg, something like that, a set of three on each leg. Bench press is probably going to be around 150 to, to 200 or 150 to 180 kilos, depending upon your ability there. Um power snatch you know so here's a good example peter jones he's going to notre dame just did two box power snatch triple at 100 kilos and he's a he's a guard so somewhere in that realm um let me know if that makes sense why are the american athletes much faster than european athletes i think it depends i think you're there's some 
countries that have, I mean, uh, Majinga Kambungi won the indoor 60 meters two years ago, and she's from Switzerland, okay? I think it just depends upon the country. I think if you look at the Polish chicks fast, um, there's been a decent amount of Greek sprinters, not a ton, but a decent amount. Brit, you know, Great Britain's got some fast people as well. It's not, ac- it's not overly accurate. It's accurate to a point. I think we have better training. <laughs> of course, I'm American, so... Is it bad to train and eat before bed if you have no other time to do it? No, I think that's okay. You got to get it done. Hi, coach. How can you be big but still with crazy agility as well as not losing the connection with the ball for a soccer player? Would you answer this? You, you, if you want to be a good soccer player, you got to do it every day, every day, every day, every day. But if you want to get bigger and have crazy agility, you've got to do that three to four days a week. So you got to base your time and figure out that time. Think about the best basketball players. They're going to the courts for four, five, six hours a day, and they're just shooting around, they're playing around, they're just doing simple things, easy, slow technical work, nothing crazy high speed, not at all times anyway. That's what you can do as far as that, that realm of soccer. Is it bad if you always feel like passing out and out of breath during athletic leg weight training? I think that might be a little bad. I think you could probably improve that, possibly. All right, this is a good chat. I'm going to get out of here because I got to get out to the this throw session to, to throw. You guys should look up uh, Cheyenne uh, Shea Williamson. She's an absolute monster. Sam Black is here. He's a Pan Am Games uh, team member from the U.S. He got fifth, I think, at Pan Am Games. So we got a lot of people on site this week. Um, Peter Jones, again, came in today. He's coming in on Thursday. So we got some cool stuff happening all week. This is like the the craziest week of the year. Like everybody's home from college. Everybody's, you know, it's the end of the year. You got to get a lot of business stuff done. It's just an absolute crazy, crazy period. So thanks for tuning in to this week's YouTube Live. If you guys need help with your training, head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store. It's our strength training app that's got everything in it that we've used the system that we've used to develop these top notch world class athletes is the same system that you could have inside of your pocket until next time peace